Okay. We can remain sitting. Okay, thank you. Kalimera. Yasu. <laughs> a bit closer. <laughs> I would like to congratulate the Hellenic Competition Commission by uh, organizing this uh, competition uh, day. Um, my knowledge of Greek is not that uh, big, um, hence my, uh, my uh, li limited use of, uh, of, uh, of Greek. Uh, Greek. Um, there was a, a famous Greek who is called Xenophon Zolatas who was the governor of the Bank of Greece in the 1950s. And he gave a speech to the Board of Governors of the International Monetary Fund. And he gave this speech in English, which apart from the articles and the prepositions consisted entirely of Greek words. So um, to compensate for my lack of Greek knowledge, I will quote two sentences from his speech, only to illustrate the richness of the Greek language. He said, and I quote, with enthusiasm, we dialogue and synagonize at the synods of our Didymus organizations in which polymorphous economic ideas and dogmas are analyzed and synthesized. Our critical problems, such as the numismatic plethora, generate some agony and me me melancholy. This phenomenon is characteristic of our epoch. But to my thesis, we have the dynamism to program therapeutic practices as a prophylaxis from chaos and catastrophe. <laughs> if that is... I think 60 years from now, that's still a very appropriate quote. So, um, after the macroeconomics of uh, numismatic plethora, we will move to the retail sector. And um, we heard it extensively this morning. Uh, the crisis touches people in their uh, revenue, in their disposable income. And the first place where you notice this is in a supermarket. So I think it's very appropriate that we uh, discuss the problems uh, related to the retail sector. And I'm very glad that we have a very distinguished panel uh, here this morning consisting of presidents or chairpersons of competition authorities, Andreas Mund from the uh, Bundeskartellamt, the Federal Competition Authority, uh, Giovanni Pitrozella, who is the chair of the Italian Competition Authority, Johanny Jokinen, uh, the Ch director general of the Finnish Competition Authority, and Lucia Christodoulou, uh, who is the chairperson of the Cypriot uh, Competition Authority. Now, the power struggle between large retailers and food suppliers uh, presents a recurring policy question for competition authorities. Because large retailers allegedly squeeze the suppliers, in particular food suppliers and farmers, and then they may change, charge high prices to consumers. And there are indeed trends in the retail landscape which support the concerns about the bargaining power and sometimes the market power, and these two concepts are not exactly equal, of big uh, retail chains. Um, if you look at modern uh, retail uh, distribution, so the big supermarkets, then in many member states, the top five retailers have close to 100% of the market. There are also buying alliances that are formed by retailers and that enable them to obtain better procurement conditions from suppliers. And there are also the, the private labels or the retailers' own brands that reinforce their position on the market. And so there are many complaints about the practices of retailers. 
And these may range from uh, unfair risk sharing models, such as the obligation to buy back unsold goods, uh, the obligation to pay for simply to get access to a shelf in a supermarket, which is <coughs> known as marketing allowances, or disproportionate access to uh, confidential information of the manufacturer, which allows to offer similar conditions. So in the face of this problem, together with the national competition authorities, we published uh, an extensive uh, report about competition issues in the food sector in uh, 2012, <coughs> Uh, where we uh, concluded that many of the complaints about the practices of retailers are essentially related to unfair trading practices in bilateral relationships. Now this uh, unfair behavior of retailers and alleged abuse of their bargaining power is not always in the strict terms of the word a competition problem. Because in order for this to be a competition problem, there needs to be uh, harm uh, to consumer uh, welfare or uh, a negative effect on the working of, uh, of the market. Now, that is of course when you apply a very strict condition of what is competition, a competition issue and what is an unfair trading condition. It is interesting that in the European competition landscape, the national competition authorities are allowed to go further to, uh, in determining what is uh, an abuse of a dominant position. So what we observe here is that at the national level, some of these practices are dealt with as a competition problem, where they, whereas they would not be if they were dealt with at the European level, but we do not have, as European Commission, that many retail cases. And in some other cases, it's, it's uh, treated as, uh, as an unfair competition uh, uh, issue. Now, um, we will hear some examples about, about uh, these type of investigations. On our side, uh, in DG Competition, we have launched uh, a fairly big study where precisely we try to find out whether there is a real competition problem. And we are on the basis of, a, of an extensive uh, survey, which the results of which we hope to publish by the summer. We are actually investigating <clears throat> whether there is a relationship over a 10-year period between innovation and uh, choice in supermarkets and in various product bundles of product categories, whether there's a relationship between innovation and choice and uh, the asymmetric relationships between the retailers and the suppliers. And if there is such a relationship, there may be an indication of a competition problem which might then need to be uh, addressed. So uh, without further ado, and, and we are, I know we are short of time, so my colleagues have all been asked to be short and to the point, and let's hope there's still some time for uh, discussion. I would like to, uh, to turn to the first uh, speaker, Andreas Bunt. Well, thank you very much, Alexander. Um, thank you very much to the Hellenic um, Competition Commission, um, Mr. Kritsakis, Dimitris, for inviting me to this event. It's my first time in Athens. I've already, already been to the Acropolis, so the main thing for me is already done, except for this very interesting session that we're going to have uh, this morning. Uh, indeed, I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the food retail uh, sector in, in Germany and describe a little bit the fields of um, intervention of the Federal Cartel Office in this area with the difficult question with regard to buyer power on the one side uh, and to unfair trading practices on the other side, and I would maybe say a word a little bit on how our activity is embedded um, in European uh, activities and uh, the European landscape, not only with regard to other national competition agencies, uh, but also with regard um, to what is happening at the European uh, Commission. Now, did I do that right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, I did. Yes. Oh, yeah, great. Thank you. Well, like in many other European countries, uh, the food retail market in Germany is highly concentrated. Uh, we have b four big players, in fact, um, that is Edeka, Rewe, uh, the Schwarz Group with Lidl and Aldi. Um, those four have a common market share of approximately 85%. And it is no wonder that this market with this structure uh, and with the behavior that we find from time to time in this market by the big retailers 
uh, is given great attention not only by competition agencies but also at the polit pol uh, political level and we have quite some discussions also at the level of the Deutsche Bundestag for example about this market uh, and how to tackle uh, the market power of these companies. Um, the challenges we, s we, we face uh, from this market structure um, are manifold. Um, one is that we in the Federal Cartel Office have received in the past very many complaints about the behavior of the big retailers uh, with regard to alleged um, abuse practices. Uh, of course, it's in the interest of the manufacturers to keep prices up in a certain way. So what we find here as one of the problems that we have uh, to deal with uh, is resale price maintenance in some areas. There's a very large case going on at my agency with regard to resale price maintenance in very many areas of food suppliers with regard to the resellers, um, retailers. We have obviously an increased incentive for cartelization on the supply side uh, due to the market power of the retailers. Only within the last two years uh, we have imposed fines on manufacturers uh, of sweets, flour, sugar and on breweries. Uh, this might be a consequence of the market power these companies face with regard to the big retailers that we have in Germany. The second issue we have to deal with is the discussion about what is the right price for food. And this I personally found also from a political point of view is a very delicate and a very difficult discussion. Usually we think that um, the price is made by competition and that an adequate price is formed uh, in competition. So from the consumer perspective, of course, a low price is favorable. So from this point of view, the buyer power of the big retail companies is good for consumers. On the other side, a higher price might be favorable from time to time with regard to guarantee the quality of the food and with regard to the existence of producers. So when we go back in history a little bit to the year of 2008, for example, the milk farmers heavily protested about milk prices in, in Germany uh, and stopped the supply of milk dairies because the prices undercut their costs. There were manifestations also in front of the Federal Cartel Office and I myself had to go out with a megaphone and discuss, um, discuss with the milk farmers. Not an easy situation at that time. Another issue in this area that sometimes at the political level you have politicians who call for high milk prices for the farmers and low prices for the consumers and both at the same time by the same politician. So that is sometimes difficult to balance also for a competition agency and that's another issue that we really discuss prices in this area. What is the right price for food also uh, from the perspective of a competition agency. The third field that we struggle with of course is the question of mergers although we already have a highly concentrated uh, market in Germany we still have merger activities going on and these merger activities still include the big players like Edeka with a market share of 25% like Rewe with a market share of 20% they still buy smaller chains, smaller uh, food retail, uh, f smaller food retailers and there we have challenges in two directions. One of course is the sales market, the relationship, the competition um, in the, um, with regard to the consumer, with regard to the merchant and the consumer and of course we have the procurement market uh, which is by far more difficult to tackle. Well, on the sales market, we take utmost care, which is a regional market, we take utmost care that the consumer in a certain region always have a, has a significant choice of supermarkets in that area. So if you have a merger in this respect, I think that's still the easiest um, area to deal with 
Uh, we impose remedies on the companies. We oblige them to divest certain supermarkets in, in, certain, in certain areas. And thus we take care that we have still competition after the merger with regard to the consumers. By far more difficult to assess is the situation on the procurement market, that is the relationship between the supplier and the retailer. That is a market that is national in scope. Uh, we have a broad range of product markets. We have very different levels of dependency between the retailers on the one side and the suppliers on the other side. We have kind of a re self-reinforcing process of market concentration. We see more and more little small retailers going out of the market, selling their business to the big ones, leaving even worse purchase conditions for those smaller uh, retailers that remain in the market. Um, and that is not, not easy to tackle, of course, and we try to do that in two ways. We try to take action in this market uh, in two ways, and our activities, I would say, are twofold in this respect. One activity is that we try to assess to what extent food retailers in Germany really have buyer power. And the second issue is that we investigate cases of alleged unfair trading practices vis-a-vis -vis the supplier. First, I will turn a little bit to our ongoing sector inquiry um, with regard to buyer power in the food sector. Uh, in order to take a closer look at the power relation between retailers on the one side and manufacturers in the retail food, in the food retail market, we have uh, initiated a sector inquiry back in 2011. Um, this uh, sector inquiry follows uh, two stages or two phases, I would say. One is on the structure of the market, the competitive conditions that we find in the market. Um, we have collected data from 21 retailers and 200 manufacturers, and we try to analyze the procurement structures for different categories of food and, um, and product markets. We try to identify different sales channels for producers. We try to identify further outside options uh, for the manufacturers. So that is all about the structure of the market as it is. The phase two was started in June 2012. There we really concentrate on the, well, precise negotiations between the food producers and the retailers, and we want to determine the relevant factors for bargaining power in this area. Uh, we have conducted a um, stratified sampling of approximately 250 articles, um, and we hope that we better understand by really going into these negotiations uh, the dy dynamics in the concentration process and facilitate our analysis on dependency uh, and dominance. So this is still ongoing, and I hope that we will publish this um, this really broad sector inquiry still um, in in um, in, uh, in the spring of this year. Uh, so that means by the end of June. The second area of activity is unfair trading practices um, that has been subject to two proceedings so far. One proceeding was also a sector inquiry in the milk sector, and the other one was, a, was the um, unfair practice behavior of Edeka after a merger. Well, first on the sector inquiry on milk. We have found evidence in this sector inquiry on the, on the milk market that um, in the milk market, um, competition is restricted almost at every level of, um, of the market. Uh, the final report was published in 2012, and as a consequence of this uh, sector inquiry, uh, we have taken two measures. The first one was uh, that we have initiated proceedings uh, to prohibit identifying market information systems. 
we had a very high degree of transparency with regard to the purchase price of milk for, da of, of, uh, for dairies and milk products in this area. And we found that this transparency was not so much useful for those who produce the dairy products. That's what they thought, and this is why they set up these market information systems. But what we found is that this transparency was extremely helpful for the food retailers who knew about the purchase prices, not only their own purchase price, but also the purchase prices of their direct competitors. So um, that facilitated, of course, some kind of coordination in the market, um, uh, not in a way that it was a formal uh, coordination, but in a way that they were able um, to, uh, well, to set the right price for them, for themselves. Uh, another was, another issue was, uh, Alexander has already men mentioned, that we looked into certain contractual termed, terms that restricted competition from our point of view. That was, for example, unreasonably long payment terms. Uh, exceeding uh, even sometimes the, produ the product's uh, storage period in the retail outlet. A second area for uh, activities uh, were unfair trading practices. Uh, that, was, that were proceedings uh, that went against Edeka, the largest um, retailer, food retailer in Germany, and that was after a merger when Edeka, the number one, bought the number five uh, on the market. Um, and the documents that we found in, this, uh, in these proceedings um, uh, showed that Edeka intended to request kind of wedding rebates after the merger from dependent uh, suppliers. It looked like a little bit like it was up to the suppliers to pay for the merger between Edeka and PLUS, between the number one and the number five uh, on the market. Um, there were various claims set up by Edeka vis-a-vis -vis the um, dependent suppliers. Uh, one was purchase prices, of course. Um, other claims were long-term payment periods, and there were all kind of bonuses and rebates uh, that were asked by Edeka uh, after the merger. Um, what, what we thought made all this abusive were two key features. One was that all this happened on a re, uh, re, retroactive basis, um, and the other one was that it was without any corresponding compensation for the suppliers. So these two features made it obvious for us that this might be, in a nutshell, uh, a abusive behavior uh, by, by Edeka. The problems we face in this case, which is still ongoing, is to draw the line between very, very hard bargaining, very hard negotiating between a dominant firm on the one side and to shape um, where the abusive behavior begins. Because even a dominant firm, of course, is allowed uh, to do a good bargain and to negotiate very tough but where does the abusive behavior begin? And uh, we are very critical when it comes to retroactive uh, measures by such a company, um, and if there is no corresponding compensation, if there is no advantage uh, for the supplier at stake. Uh, so this is a difficult question we are facing in, uh, in this area. Maybe a quick look uh, at how we embed our activities uh, into European activities. Alexander already mentioned that the fact that most cases in this area are cases at the national level that national competition agencies are, are dealing with. That makes a lot of sense because food, read mark, uh, food, food retail markets are national or even regional in scope, and they are to a very large extent uh, still characterized by national features. Um, of course, they are of a international relevance, um, and this is why we discuss these cases a lot within the ECN. Um, the Commission has published a report on competition law enforcement and market monitoring uh, activities by European competition authorities in the food sector back in 2012. 
there is a regular exchange between national competition agencies uh, in the subgroup on food within uh, the ECN. There has been a high-level forum for the better functioning of the food supply chain uh, that has implemented initiatives and uh, principles at the Commission's level, and last but not least, what was very important for us, there has been a green paper on unfair trading practices in the B2B food and non-food supply chain back in Jan January 2013. And this green paper has been very helpful for us as a national competition agencies because we took some care that the cases we are dealing with in the area of abusive behavior was very much embedded and went very much along the lines um, of this European initiative, along the lines of this green paper. And this has facilitated a lot from my point of view, the discussion with the companies uh, in these cases and um, in this, in this uh, area. Uh, so I think what we see here is a kind of action taken at the national level in various forms, but pretty much and pretty well embedded in what is happening uh, at the level of the European Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. I think you have demonstrated um, how close these notions of unfair trading practices and uh, abuse of buying power are inter interrelated. And in fact, you have in an interrelated way used the words unfair and abuse. Uh, but I think it also demonstrates how important it is that uh, a competition agency is well equipped to, um, to address these issues from, from one, one perspective or uh, another. Now let's now move to, to Italy. Uh, Giovanni, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And, and thank you to the Hellenic Competition uh, Commission for inviting me uh, in this uh, important European Competition Day. I followed with great interest Andrea's presentation and because uh, uh, vertical relationships uh, in the retail sector and notably biopower have increasingly attracted at the attention of both policymakers and competition authorities in various countries. And uh, the Italian Competition Authority has played an important and active role in the debate. It has conducted two important sector inquiries, one on the food distribution chain and one on the large retail distribution sector. Uh, I will briefly share with you some of the key findings. After the last of these uh, inquiries, the Italian Competition Authority opened a formal investigation on the largest joint purchasing agreement alliance in Italy. This is point two of my presentation. However, the key issue uh, I would like to talk about today is the gray area in which antitrust enforcement might not be enough. In Italy, this grey area is now being addressed by two different sets of provisions. The general prohibition of the abuse of economic dependence and more recent ad hoc provisions that apply to food and agricultural products. Let me start with some facts. At the end of the last year, the Italian Competition Authority published the results of an in-depth sector inquiry on the large retail sector. As part of the investigation, we conducted a survey on a sample of agro-food firms representative of 23 food sectors. Uh, we asked questions on the characteristics of the contractual relationships uh, with large retailers, on the nature and relevance of the fees paid by producers, etc. Several of these issues relate to usual trade relationship among market players at different stages of industry chains and do not necessarily raise competition concerns. However, the findings of the Italian Competition Authority survey show that the relationship between producers and large retailers is certainly not a comfortable one. 
food producers are confronted with complex and long negotiations. Suppliers are often requested to deliver goods at large retailers even before the agreement have been formalized. Sometimes large retailers unilaterally change the contractual conditions. Negotiation focus on two main categories of items. Discounts and trade spending, i.e. additional fees paid by suppliers in return for promotional and display services. Trade spending has become a key contractual uh, element. It represents up to 40% of the overall value of negotiation and it is also the main cause of tensions between suppliers and large retailers. Um, the food retail sector, anyway, is less concentrated in Italy than in other European countries. The three top retailers account for less than 35% of the total value. Instead, in the UK, Germany, France and Spain, the shares of the top three retailers are higher than 55%. Nevertheless, in Italy, retailers have increased their bargaining power by forming super alliances. In 2012, seven super alliances comprised 21 retail chains and accounted for 78% of supermarket sales at national level. Concerns. Uh, uh, relating uh, uh, um, buyer power and its effects on competition have risen in Italy as well. Buyer power emerges at, level, at levels of concentration lower than those needed to establish traditional dominance. It appears that market shares of 15-20% might already be sufficient for large retailers to exert buyer power vis-à-vis -vis food suppliers, as long as a large retailer is able to obtain more favorable terms than those available to other buyers. Buyer powers might be seen in a positive terms insofar as the better conditions secured by powerful retailers from the producers are passed through onto consumers. However, it is competition among retailers in the downstream market that forces the powerful retailers to reduce prices. Significant real competition in the retail market being absent, powerful retailers may have low incentives to pass on to consumers the gain resulting from buyer power in the upstream markets. Buyer power may have, might also have detrimental effects on competition and consumer welfare in the long term. First of all, as regards competition in distribution markets, it is important to highlight that weaker retailers might suffer from buyer power. In fact, as happened in Italy, food suppliers might try to compensate the better commercial terms granted to powerful buyers by worsening the commercial terms applied to less powerful buyers. This might lessen retail competition. In other words, powerful retailers would not only enjoy better purchasing conditions, but would also worsen other retailers' purchasing conditions, thus raising their rivals' costs. Moreover, it is important to consider competition in upstream markets. For producers, the, the pressure on prices caused by powerful retailers might decrease the supplied quantity and unduly restrict input supply available to consumers. Buyer power might also oblige producers to reduce investments so as to cope with lower sale prices. However, it is must uh, be clear that the problem is not for weak retailers and producers as such, but for the ensuing dangers from competition and consumer welfare. The study, um, um, the study observes that there is a gray area where uh, um, 
vertical relationships might restrain competition in the downstream or in the upstream markets, but the typical antitrust tools against abuses of dominant position and restrictive agreements might not be available to ensure effective intervention. The key political question, though, are still unanswered. Do competition authorities really need to worry about buyer power even when it does not amount to a breach of Article 101 or Article 102? Is intervention in the grey area desirable or even necessary, and along what lines? Before turning to the most difficult question, I would like to briefly cover the most traditional one, ground. Um, after the sector inquiry, at the end uh, of last all year, the Italian Competition Authority opened an Article 101 investigation into the largest Italian super alliance among larger supermarket retail chains, Centrale Italiana. Centrale Italiana negotiates procurement agreements on behalf of five retail chains. Negotiations include, in particular, the terms and conditions concerning discounts and trade spending. The market shares jointly held by the parties to the Central Italiana Agreement exceeded the 15% thresholds above which, according to the guidelines on horizontal cooperation agreements, joint purchasing agreements are presumed to have anti-competitive effects. It is also much larger than the 14% market share counted for by the second largest super alliance. The comp our competitive concerns involve both the upstream markets in terms of foreclosure of weaker but efficient suppliers and the distribution markets in terms of potential collusion. Let me mm, enter now into the uncharted territory beyond traditional enforcement of competition law. As in other countries, the perceived inadequacy of typical antitrust rules has been invoked in Italy to justify further regulatory interventions. Uh, legislation against abuse of economic dependence was first enacted in Italy in 1998. Uh, the Italian law defines economic dependence as the situation in which an undertaking is able to determine an excessive imbalance of rights and obligations in its dealings with another undertaking. Economic dependence is assessed taking into account in Teralia the effective possibility for the aggrieved party to find satisfactory alternatives on the market. The abuse of economic dependence may also consist in a refusal to deal the imposition to unfair or discriminatory trading conditions or the unlawful termination of existing contractual relations. Um, one moment. Okay. The position and uh, um, the role of the Italian Competition Authority uh, has changed in time. Uh, when the law on the abuse of economic dependence was passed, the Italian Competition Authority expressed its opinion against its inclusion in Italian competition. Uh, in particular, it was highlighted that this was a matter concerning private contractual relationships among the parties and not the public interest of protecting competition. Three years later, the new law was amended and the enforcement of the abuse of economic dependence was entrusted also upon the Italian Competition Authority, but only when it is relevant for the protection of competition. Um, however, in 2012, a new law was enacted to address concerns specifically in the vertical relationships within the agricultural food chain the new provision is designed to prevent unfair conducts in case of significant imbalance of contractual power. C 
crucially for the provision to be applicable, a, posi a dominant position is not required. Asymmetrical contractual power is enough. The provision entrusts the Italian Competition Authority with surveillance and fining powers. Nonetheless, uh, the Italian Competition Authority's intervention does not exclude the ability of private parties to bring their claims before civil courts. So there is a dual system of enforcement. The new law defines the minimum requirements for business-to-business -business contracts as regards the sale of agricultural and food products. Contracts must be written and must specify the duration of the supply agreement, the characteristics and the prices of the products, the delivery and payment terms. In addition, a set of trading practices are prohibited. Um, the provision uh, uh, apl uh, applies uh, uh, to contractual relations where a significant uh, imbalance exists in the party's bargaining position. According to our uh, um, prior, um, list of priority, uh, the, the new law will be applied according to the following criteria. Significant of the competition um, um, uh, significant of the competition restriction and frequency of the unfair conduct. In other words, the competition agency's intervention will focus on those cases in which the contractual abuse may cause a significant harm to relevant public interest. Therefore, the Italian Competition Authority will only intervene where the conduct at stake is sufficiently consistent and diffuse to cause such harm. The aim of antitrust enforcement is not to protect weaker players, but to promote a level playing field and an effective competition. Therefore, protecting weaker market players is not an end in itself, but a means by which competition is safeguarded. This calls for a strong effect-based approach. Barrier power exists, and it might matter not only for the parties, but also for competition. However, it might well matter in a gray area, vertical relationships that might restrain competition in the downstream or in the upstream markets, but would not be caught by traditional antitrust tools intervention by competition authority in the gray area is not an obvious extension of its traditional remit. Nonetheless, entrusting the application of rules on business to business and fair trading practices to competition agencies allows for a competition-oriented interpretation of such rules. In turn, this calls for a careful, effect-based approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giovanni. Let me first make clear that I am not related in any form whatsoever to the Centrale Italiana. Uh, sec secondly, I think you have uh, illustrated how in, um, in a progressive way uh, you try to keep the competition angle into the uh, area of unfair trading practice and I think that's, that's very, uh, very interesting. On the one hand you are pursuing one-on-one case uh, but you're also looking at uh, the competition related aspects of unfair trading practices uh, and, not, and not at the protection of competitors as such which I think we all agree should not be an objective of competition policy. So I think it's a very interesting uh, and modern uh, development. Now let's now look to, uh, to Finland. Uh, Johanny. Thank you, Chair. And th <clears throat> thank you for the invitation and uh, also thank you for this uh, wonderful event. I'm... Let me see. Is there any? Is this one? No. Let's 
not working anymore. So <clears throat> I'm going to discuss uh, the Finnish solution for this problem. Maybe it's not a, a total solution, but nevertheless a, a small solution. So we created uh, last year a, an amendment to competition law, which stipulates that uh, with the market share, exceeding 30%, the company in question is in, uh, in a dominant position uh, if the question is of uh, daily consumer good market. And uh, the background for this amendment is, is clear. It's obvious that uh, there was in Finland, all, all the same problems which are already mentioned here, lively debate, political pressure, and so on and so on, and also pressure from the Commission side and uh, from the OECD to boost some uh, competition in the uh, retail sector. And the, the reason for this is, uh, is the first bullet point, the concentration race uh, two, that means the two biggest players, they have more than uh, 80%, S group more than uh, 45%, K group more than 35%. So that was the background. And I want to mention also this uh, last bullet point. Uh, 2012, the government uh, launched a program which was called uh, program for uh, sound competition and uh, in that uh, or during that process and in that program uh, Finland created uh, this legislation so of course there was other solutions as well uh, on the table but uh, this seemed to be the uh, most workable So what we mean then by, <clears throat> by this uh, dominance solution? There is only one section added to the competition law, which uh, says that if an undertaking whose market share is uh, in retail sector of uh, daily consumer goods in Finland is at least 30%, this company is considered to hold a dominant position in the market for daily consumer goods. So it's, uh, it looks very simple, but in pra practice there is, of, of course, many pitfalls, many difficulties to interpret this uh, provi uh, provision. Uh, the first, uh, first uh, observation is that the, uh, this impacts only the two biggest trading groups, the K group and S group. And, uh, it's, it's clear that this uh, percentage there, 30%, had a, and has a very clear uh, 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 dividing line between the companies which, to which this uh, law is uh, uh, applied. If it would have been 40, it would be only S group if uh, now, when it's 30, it's both those big trading groupings which, uh, to which this uh, law uh, can be uh, applied. And you can imagine that there was huge debate uh, <coughs> whether it should be, which percentage we should use. But we chose this one so that the uh, the playing field is, is in this sense, more, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, yeah, level to, to, to both big uh, groupings. Uh, when we, by law, 
say now that the S group and K group has a dominant position, this has no impact. This, is, uh, this comes uh, from the law. It doesn't affect merger control. And <clears throat> one important thing is that it doesn't change the substance of abuse of market dominance. So all these uh, jurisprudence we have from the un uh, European Union and, uh, and uh, national uh, uh, judicial cases as well has created the content of abuse and that's not changed by this uh, new regulation. Uh, one limit which we haven't faced yet, but which, uh, which we have to take into, into consideration is the uh, uh, <clears throat> Regulation uh, 1, 2003, and uh, more precisely Article uh, 3. So we can't uh, prohibit such a behavior which is allowed by the EU regulations. First of all, allowed by Article 101. And the entry into force was uh, in the beginning of this year. There is the, uh, the, uh, the section in, in question. I will skip that uh, slide and come to the, the uh, <clears throat> interest, interesting questions. Does it deliver. We are not uh, quite sure yet. Uh, some good results ha has been achieved, but the, uh, there is also some, uh, so to speak, uh, traps for competition authorities and uh, for competition. It might be so that the, the so, uh, lowest card is dealt uh, to competition authority or, and to competition uh, in, in this play because the parties in this area can also uh, take some advantages from this legislation. One big question has been whether, or, and, and there has been also, oversized expectancy to cut buyer power. So it's clear that industry and primary pr production wants us to limit buyer power, which would mean problems to competition and to consumer welfare. One interesting point is, and there is a lot of them, but I just took uh, one on the slide. Is there an obligation to buy from all sellers with, with with the same price. So uh, if there is an, uh, let me say, uh, an international producer of a um, certain product which has the lowest price, does it mean that there is no possibilities to buy from other suppliers because it would otherwise create a discrimination against this international player? Or, of course, it can be a domestic one as well. Of course, this is not the case. One very largely discussed issue was whether this will decrease the shelf space for domestic and local food. And here, once again, in the background was the question of prices. An additional question, of course, was whether the uh, trading groups are uh, obliged to buy from each sellers of uh, uh, certain uh, products if it buys one from one, once again, in order to avoid this uh, discrimination claim. Of course, this is not true, so we apply the normal uh, uh, EU concept of abuse, uh, which is relies 
for instance, the, the Hoffman, uh, Hoffman uh, Laros uh, case. And all these problems are very detailed, uh, touched in the, in the motivation of uh, the government's bill. But these questions which were in, in public discussion during the uh, parliament phase has not been realized in, in practice. So what we have done now, and as a matter of fact, uh, before uh, entry into force of this uh, piece of legislation, uh, we have had a negotiation or advice period between uh, uh, the trade groupings, where we have gone through uh, uh, the most obvious questions, issues, which may raise risk of abuse. And they have, as far as we know, changed to a certain extent their business behavior. There is this re risk transfer, self-payment, and certain private label issues which, which have been already mentioned here. But more or less these are uh, not very interesting from the competition point of view but mostly, for instance, this uh, risk transfer uh, is, uh, or, or self-payments, uh, self they are questions of uh, fair trading practices. But what we are now doing, and uh, which are the two most uh, important uh, pending cases, one is the uh, statistics, so, uh, at the moment, our foodstuff industry do not know which are the uh, consumer habits in this market, which, uh, which are the uh, uh, demand trends, because there is no uh, statistics which would show uh, where the demand is is going and this is of course enhancing the gatekeeper role of these two trade trading groupings and what we try to do is to create some kind of uh, statistics which will uh, uh, shed light on this problem and this information uh, it's going to be uh, a little bit difficult, but uh, we use either this new provision or then the famous Mackill principle in order to create something. Uh, then this loyalty rebate scheme is interesting. The loyalty scheme uh, system in Finland is, is more or less the same as frequent liar, flyer programs in the, uh, in the airlines. So both these uh, groupings have uh, cards or customers can uh, buy uh, with some euros a card and then later on after one year, one month, they will get some, some rebates depending on the, uh, the amount of purchases. And now what we are doing is to investigate, uh, uh, investigate whether this is anti-competitive or whether it's uh, neutral for, for competition. It's going to be a very interesting uh, uh, investigation, not only because they give the, the, those cards to their own customers in the foodstuff sector, but both groupings have uh, created such a uh, network of partners, which means that uh, rebates can be get also from the purchases from certain opticians, from certain pharmacies, from certain electricity companies, from certain teleoperators, from cer certain uh, uh, insurance companies, and so on and so on, which will maybe compartmentalize this, this, uh, the whole Finnish retail market. 
Then we have also, not we, but uh, the, uh, but the uh, trading groupings, and uh, they have created, more or less because of this new legislation, the uh, dispute resolution mechanism uh, to uh, Finland Chamber of Commerce, with, and uh, they have They use these uh, pr so-called principles of good practice in the food supply chain, which comes from the European Union and has been already mentioned, mentioned, mentioned here. I think uh, that was all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johanny. If, if I may characterize the Finnish approach, I think that on the one hand you have, you have tried through this new definition of dominance uh, to, to give a very clear uh, threshold. On the other hand, uh, there is also the signal that uh, in terms of the definition of what is an abuse, you, will, you, you do not intend to go beyond the, the usual uh, definition uh, in, in EU competition law. On the other hand, there are a number of practices and you have mentioned uh, some of them, slotting allowances and, uh, and, uh, and so on, uh, risk, uh, risk sharing, that uh, may be on the verge or on the border of a competition problem and, and you try to, through a dialogue and, and, uh, and perhaps uh, through a dispute settlement to, to make sure that they do not enter into what would be considered as a, as a competition abuse. I think that's more or less the characterization of the, of the Finnish approach. Now, um, Let's stay a bit closer to uh, where we are now, uh, Cyprus, Lucia. I'm so happy to be with you here today at um, uh, this beautiful Zapion building. And uh, permit me, before I actually start, uh, to convey to you the very warm greetings um, of the Greek uh, Competition Commission. I would like to firstly thank Chairman Giritsakis, Vice Chair Dimitris Luka, and uh, his colleagues at the Hellenic Competition Committee for inviting me to speak on this panel and for giving me the opportunity to share the experience of my small Cypriot competition authority in the application of competition rules in Cyprus. I will start by explaining how small the competition authority is, the Cypriot competition authority is, and how small the economy of Cyprus is. Just to give you the right perspective. The Cyprus competition for the protection of uh, competition, as you can see, consists of just 12 case handlers who are supported by one chartered accountant, seconded, meaning on loan, by the accountant's general office and by consultants on yearly contracts for the present time. And as from July, there will just remain three consultants with contracts until the end of the year. Under the MOU, the Republic of Cyprus um, said that this, the Cypriot authorities will strengthen the dependence and the effectiveness of the Commission for the Protection of Competition by providing sufficient and stable financial means, as well as qualified personnel to enhance its effective operation. Moreover, the CPC has proceeded with amendments to the competition legislation, and also with the replacement of the major legislation, both in line with more convergence with EU legislation. The newly amended competition law introduces for the first time the power for conducting sector inquiries. So our authority will have at its disposal one more important tool that will aid it to safeguard competition in the markets. I will now give you some more figures for the Cypriot economy. Cyprus is a small open economy. Cyprus GDP at market prices 2013 was 16 point billion euros as compared to EU 27, that is EU excluding Cyprus, that was more than 13 trillion euros. Imports are 43.5% of GDP and exports are 45 of GDP. 
the tertiary sector, financial activities, wholesale and retail services and other activities, accounted for 82.3% of GDP in 2012, whereas the secondary sector, manufacturing, accounted for 15.4% of GDP in 2012. The primary sector, agriculture and fishing, is continuously shrinking and reached 2.3% of GDP in 2012. Cyprus has no heavy industry, and all the oil is important. We hope, of course, that this will change in the near future. The internet usage in Cyprus is very low compared to other European countries, and therefore, electronic commerce adoption is currently in its very early stages. Finally, Cyprus has the highest energy dependency rate in the EU at 95% in 2012. This is due to the fact that nearly all the energy consumed in Cyprus originates from crude oil and petroleum products which are imported. Energy from <coughs> renewable sources consumed in Cyprus was 5.1% in 2012 compared with 11% of the EU average. At the end of March 2014, the Protection of Competition Law of 2008 was amended. The most important changes concern the ability of the CPC to conduct sector inquiries, as I have just mentioned, the prioritization of cases, the amendment of the criteria for the issuance of interim or, or the measures, the collection of forensic IT evidence, and its cooperation with other authorities. At this point, I would like to note the power of the Commission to investigate the abuse of economic dependence between enterprises and that quite a few cases that have been investigated concern this kind of abuse. The CPC has been vigilant in taking notice of changes that are in novel issues arising in regard to the retail sector and the difficulties that ensue from dealing with these issues. The Commission is aware that it may in the future be confronted with issues that arise in appliance competition law in other member states, for example, in relation to the new line of cases that relate to online sales and the internet as the new distribution channel. The cases dealt with by the Commission in relation to retail trade and diverse are diverse and are investigated on a case-by-case -case basis based on a complaint or after, an, after a decision of an ex officio investigation by the Commission. I will start by presenting some of the more classic cases and move on to the most novel ones. Case A concerns a distributor of Habano cigars submitted, that submitted a complaint in 2006 that a major importer and distributor of a wide range of kiosk products, including Habano cigars, was threatening his customers that he would cease to supply the whole range of his products in case they cooperated or continued to buy Habano cigars from the complainant, and that therefore the latter undertaking was abusing its dominant position. The Commission noted that the refusal or a threat of refusal to supply the whole range or part of the portfolio of pro products of an undertaking without objective justification can lead, according to the portfolio effects theory, to an infringement of competition rules. However, the Commission, by a majority decision, did not find that there was an infringement on, on the law of this case. A similar case in 2006 concerned a complaint by a kiosk owner against the above-mentioned major importer and distributor of a variety of kiosk products, including Habano cigars, for refusal to supply him with his products because the owner of the kiosk was purchasing the Habano cigars he sold from another undertaking. The complainant claimed that the distributor was infringing Article 6 of the law equivalent to Article 102, since he suddenly and without uh, objective uh, justification ceased to supply his store with all his product, thus severing their long-term commercial relationship. The Commission found that the distributor had infringed competition on the basis of, of Section 6 of the law for the abuse of a relation of economic dependence and imposed a fine. 
the Commission in 2004, after concluding an, an ex officio investigation, issued a decision that the two soft drink companies producing Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola that operated in the Republic of Cyprus should cease their practice of concluding anti-competitive agreements and refraining from concluding such agreements in the future. Uh, in 2005, the Commission dealt with the complaint of a snacks manufacturer against a competitor that had a dominant position in the market of crisps and other snacks. The complaint concerned contracts concluded between the dominant snacks manufacturer and supermarkets, bakeries, and other points of sale. It was claimed that in some cases, the agreements contained terms according to which discounts were awarded if the supermarket maintained terms according to which discounts were awarded if the supermarket maintained the agreed shelf space for stacking of dominant manufacturer product. The commission with a majority decision concluded that on the evidence before it, no infringement of the law was established. Now we will turn to the ongoing investigations. There is currently an ongoing investigation in uh, relation to an alleged abuse of the dominant position by a company that is a manufacturer and distributor of detergents following a complaint filed by a distributor of detergents in 2012. The complainant alleges that the detergents company infringed sections 6 uh, of the protection of competition law in relation to the fixing of unfair practices restricting production of distribution of products to the detriment of consumers and making the conclusion of contracts subject to acceptance by other parties of supplementary obligations which by their nature or according to commercial usage have no connection with the subject of such contracts. The issue of impeding parallel trade of the products through preventing their sale at the retail level features in this case. The Commission decided to apply Article 102 in parallel with Article 6 of the national legislation. A down raid was also conducted at the premises of the dominant company and five retail stores at five retail stores which sell its products in the area of Nicosia. A big European car manufacturer has adopted selective distribution for the vehicles and spare parts it manufacturers for his vehicles. At first, the manufacturer did not apply strictly the selective distribution, at least in Cyprus, so there were parallel imports of genuine spare parts. However, in 2010, it decided to apply the selective distribution strictly so parallel imports of the genuine spare parts stopped. Two spare parts importers submitted a complaint to the Commission in 2011 that the selective distribution system infringed Article 6 of the law and Article 102 of the treaty by restricting the supply of genuine spare parts in the geographic market of Cyprus, as there remain only one importer and distributor of genuine spare parts of the aforementioned uh, ECM, the official local distributor of cards and their spare parts. The Commission investigated the complaint and concluded that there was a prima facie infringement of Article 6 of the law and Article 102 of the treaty in the geographic markets of Cyprus and sent a statement of objections to the manufacturer and its local uh, distributor. The case is proceeding uh, soon to the stage of the hearing. Another case is uh, the Association of Renewable Energy Sellers that filed a complaint in 2013 against the Electricity Authority of Cyprus for abuse of dominance. The complaint concerned the entry of the incumbent Electricity Authority in the market for installing net metering photovoltaic systems. Specifically, a plan was announced 
by the regulator for energy that allowed the installation of 2,000 such systems for homeowners who are considered to belong to the low income category and who were eligible to receive a grant by the state and 3,000 such systems for other homeowners. The net metering photovoltaic system is a fairly new development in the Cyprus energy field. Through these systems, a homeowner, after, install, after installing the set system, has to pay only the difference between the electricity supplied by the electricity authority and the electricity produced through photovoltaic systems. The incumbent electricity authority announced that it would accept applications to finance the installations for 200 homeowners who belong in the low income group of the population and payment for such installation will be affected through monthly installments in four to six years. The electricity, the electricity authority announced this plus as a social package designed to help such homeowners. It is noted that uh, the incumbent electricity authority is the producer of electricity in Cyprus and is also responsible for the distribution and supply of electricity to all homes in Cyprus. The complainants also applied for the issuance of interim measures, which were declined by the Commission, and the case is under investigation. Finally, the last couple of years saw a consolidation between distributors of a variety of products. Although Cyprus is a small country with a small population, the distribution costs are pretty high due to the small population of 800,000 being dispersed in a relatively large geographic area and especially in small towns or villages, uh, quite a lot of which are on the mountains. Therefore, distributors have to reach all areas to supply their goods, but for a small number of consumers, and uh, this increases their distribution costs as, as they have to be a, pop, a proportion to relatively small sales. A very characteristic example is the distribution of fresh milk, which has to be delivered in uh, refrigerated conditions to small villages of 60 to 80 people on the highest or most remote mountains. The first merger concerned the creation of a joint control company by the distributor of a portfolio of products, including foodstuffs, beverages, and certain non-foodstuffs items like plastic bags and packaging items, as well as mobile telephonic cards, and the distributor of a variety of foodstuffs, alcoholic beverages, tobacco, and related products, and certain non-foodstuff items like plastic gloves. The purpose of uh, the new company was to undertake the distribution of the portfolio of foodstuffs, tinned and frozen fish, frozen vegetables, olive oil, cheese, and alcoholic beverages, wine, uzo, and vodka, of both distributors. The assessment of this merger led to the conclusion that there, were, that there was no affected market. The second merger concerned again the creation of a joint control company by two distributors for the distribution of all their products, which consisted of consumer products like tin foodstuffs, flower products and their sauces, confectionery items, snacks, cereals, butter, cheese, and various frozen items like frozen vegetables and frozen meat, frozen fish, and frozen bakery items, rice and rice milk, chocolates, and uh, other food supplements, pet food and accessories, as well as items used in the catering business. Once again, the conclusion was that there was no affected market. Uh, the above mergers brought in the limelight the issue of the portfolio effect as the above mentioned mergers created distributors with a very wide range of products for retail sale, but without actually having a dominant position in any specific market. 
To conclude, the Commission has dealt with a number of cases in the retail sector, although not so much in the novel areas of enforcement. However, with the recent cases in national antitrust law and the new powers to investigate specific sectors which may seem to be problematic, as far as competition is concerned, the Commission will be able to deal with more cases in the novel areas of enforcement. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lucia. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you with the new changes in the Cypriot law because it's a perfect illustration of the, uh, of the sort of issues that uh, we will be addressing in the report that the Vice President announced this morning on the 10 years anniversary of Regulation 1 2003 in, in terms of equipping all competition authorities with the necessary tools and, and, and instruments, whether small or big. And secondly, you, you have illustrated that even in a small island economy, uh, you can encounter exactly the same type of competition problems that we also find in, in other jurisdictions, and that therefore it's important to have a fully functioning competition system uh, also, also there. Now, I've been given very strict instructions uh, to uh, respect the timing for this session. Um, I would only like to conclude with uh, a small look towards the the other side of the Atlantic in the US where in fact there's a similar discussion going on. If you look at the uh, uh, Federal Trade Commission and uh, the act on which the uh, Federal Trade Commission operates sec uh, and it's uh, section 5, there you find a, refer ref a reference to uh, in, uh, when it comes to the responsibility of the Federal Trade Commission that they should guard against uh, uh, unfair methods of competition and unfair uh, methods uh, uh, of, uh, of commerce. And whereas the, the unfair methods of uh, commerce come very close to the unfair uh, trading practices that we have been discussing this morning, there is a kind of gray area as to what unfair methods of competition actually are. And there's a whole debate in the United States about the extent to which the Federal Trade Commission can go further than uh, the Department of Justice can go in terms of applying uh, section 1 and Section 2 of the Sherman Act. So the debate we were having this morning about the gray area, as it was uh, called by, by Giovanni, uh, between unfair trading practices and competition policy is not exclusively a European issue. It's also uh, a transatlantic uh, uh, issue, and I'm sure other uh, jurisdictions around the world are faced uh, with, these, with, with these issues. Um, I think that the discussion this morning has demonstrated that there are various ways of dealing, uh, dealing with this. You can do so through an exclusive uh, unfair trading practices approach. You can also try to bring it into a competition policy, but only restrict it to the competition, uh, competition uh, effect. And there are also means of uh, exercising uh, soft pressure, if I may call it like that, uh, as demonstrated by, by Johanny. So I think it's a very vivid area, a very important area for the future, very important for, for citizens, especially in terms of crisis, and I think you will, you will join me uh, in expressing Fkharistopoli for all our panelists. Thank you. We can have one or two questions. Good, I'm happy. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the, uh, this, the new session of, of some uh, few questions. Uh, Stefanos Komnenos, Secretary General for Commerce, so competent official of the Greek government. And uh, let me thank you for your very important uh, remarks. Uh, let me allow you, uh, let, let me allow for, uh, to, to share with you a few remarks of the Greek situation and uh, then raise uh, one or two questions. Well. In Greece, we don't have the same concentration uh, uh, you face in, uh, in Germany. Um, well, it's about the six first uh, retailers not getting higher than 70% of the market. But there is a situation in a local level where we have high concentrations, more than 50%. So the first issue is how we... Um, uh, how we rate the, 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 um, 
the, the, the market uh, the market area, how do we uh, consider it, how do we uh, count it? The second issue, we, uh, there's of course a tendency uh, for retailers throughout the world to increase their bargaining power. This is not uh, only due to the general rule of capitalism that uh, companies grow and try to get higher sales, but in the retail sector case, there is a change in the marketing tools they use. From uh, uh, the above-the-line promotional activities, uh, which five years ago, ten years ago, represented more than 80% of the budget a supplier uh, spent to promote their products, more than 50% now go directly to the store below the line activities. Uh, this has uh, changed the power between retailer and supplier, as it is the retailer actually who uh, demands what is going to be, be promoted and how within its store. And this has also created another subsequence. Consumers need uh, uh, clear prices to make them uh, uh, come up with a, a rational decision what to choose. Through the huge increase of these promotional activities, they don't have any more a clear approach, a clear view what is beneficial for, for them to choose or not. And this is something the Greek government has tried to tackle by introducing uh, some uh, provisions for, let's call them net prices uh, on the self, or by making more transparent how the promotional price um, uh, with, uh, is compared to, the, to the, 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 the original price, whether there is a, a discount and how much of it. Okay? This is the second issue. And the third issue has to do with uh, the way the retailers operate uh, in a national or regional level. Uh, in Greece, uh, we uh, face a situation where the major retailers have become national ones. And what they are trying to do is, for their own reasons, uh, to have a, a unique uh, pricing policy around the country. This means that, uh, in a way, they increase the prices they should have in large uh, uh, cities, where the, co the cost is lower. And have, in order to have lower prices in uh, the periphery, but in that way, actually, they push away local and periphery retailers. So that dubbing mechanism is a major issue. And uh, finally, the, the, the relationship between retailers and suppliers, uh, OFT, Office for Trade in the UK, has uh, uh, approached it, uh, has, has issued several uh, best practices. The Greek government is considering to, to use them or use some of your best practices here and um, create a code of practice for, for soft, soft law, in a way. Uh, it seems that we, uh, except of the trade terms in issues like uh, how much or when you should pay me, there's a second issue which has to do with the uh, payment period. And here we have different European uh, experiences. Uh, some 10 years ago, the French uh, imposed a law for uh, ceilings in that period. I think it was one or two months for fresh products and something longer uh, for, for other products. Uh, the Spanish government. Uh, one year ago, introduced a law for, for lower 
uh, period. Uh, and it's something very crucial f right now for economies under crisis where, they, um, um, where money is scarce, there is no liquidity. And uh, what is actually happening now is that a large retailer with its huge bargaining power um, pushes the cost of money to their suppliers. And this creates an extra cost for uh, small producers. Thank you. Well, I think you're opening a whole new session here. <laughs> but these are the issues. Um, but they are not necessarily all competition issues. Uh, but um, let me look at my co-panelist. Maybe, Andreas, you want to react to something? Yeah, ma maybe, maybe just, just briefly. You mentioned soft law uh, in, in your question. Well, we have tried with soft law very many years ago. I can tell you it doesn't work. Um, we are talking here about a lot of money, a lot of money. And the only question in this area, in the relationship between the supplier and the retailer, is where does the rent go? Does it go to the supplier? Does it go to the retailer? What's the role of the consumer in this game? And this is a division of money that you will never tackle with soft law, from my point of view. You need to discuss those to those people, but in the very end you need proceedings or you need a very strict law uh, in order to regulate uh, these issues. This is nothing uh, with regard uh, to soft law. Uh, we, we looked at the um, payment periods. Uh, as I said, in, 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 the, in the milk sector inquiry, uh, we thought there was an abusive element in this, but I must add that in Germany, um, our, our law with regard to abusive behavior is stricter than European law. Uh, the German law has a little bit of the approach um, to protect, to a certain extent, small and medium-sized enterprises. This is not so much about competition law, and if I talk about that at the OECD with my U.S. colleagues, they say, Andreas, I don't even know what you are talking about, you know, because that is completely unknown in, in the U.S. But I think this is a feature that is not that bad, and you could have it in the competition law as well as any other law. So we are able to base our well, proceedings that I have described with regard, for example, uh, to payment periods, we are able to base that uh, as at least partly on these special parts of German law, which from my point of view can be very helpful. Question of promotion activities, I think that's a, a little bit a question of consumer protection. That is not so much a competition issue. We have a, a, comp we have a discussion on that as well in Germany, especially with regard to food for kids because there is promotion going on, of course, addressed directly to kids and, um, well, not so much addressed to the parents and it's then the kids who address the parents what they should buy, which is not also always healthy for kids. So we have a discussion on this issue, but from my point of view, this is not really a competition issue. This is something on consumer protection and how we deal with, um, with these, uh, with these uh, issues in this area. Problem of market situation um, in, in this respect. Um, well, um, when it comes to buyer power, you cannot really work with market shares. I mean, market shares may be a starting point, but really not much more in this area. And this is why we go directly into the negotiation between the retailers and the suppliers. And we look at that. Um, it's, it's not so much it's not so much how high is a market share of a certain retailer in a certain area. So difficult to answer the question only on the basis of market structure and there I would follow very much the approach of Giovanni that we really have to look into the effects on what is really going on in this market and what are the results of a certain negotiation between a supplier on the one side and the retailer on the other side. Thank you. Uh, maybe another uh, angle of view. Uh, what it is all about in this uh, 
question in Finland anyway, and I think this is the case. Uh, if there is no uh, alternatives, the seller is price taker, and it's uh, we can't we cannot say that the competition is uh, workable. So, I, I, of course, it's important to have some kind of uh, network uh, for uh, to resist sub, such a behavior, which is unfair. But from a competition point of view, in human, the issue is that we try to create such an environment where this market power or buying power cannot be used in order to artificially foreclose even more that uh, market in question and uh, create some, some artificial uh, uh, limitations for, for competitors or such uh, suppliers, for instance, uh, which are selling to, to, to competitors of the, uh, of the uh, big companies. Uh, and I think that's, that's why we have, for this purpose, we have created this, this new le uh, uh, legislation, and this is the important thing. Otherwise, so the more we try to protect some farmers, create some new uh, uh, methods, or, or clarifications which can be uh, used in order to guarantee uh, fair prices or fair uh, conditions for their, their uh, entrepreneurship, the more and more uh, uh, difficult issues we face because there is always coming some new uh, ways to limit competition or, or limit uh, the farmers or, or weak suppliers' uh, uh, profits. So the only answer, I think, is that there must be opportunities for bus uh, other businesses, opportunities to use alternatives, other options, and that will help. I have to stop, or we can have another question? I'm in your hands, huh? One more question. Last question. Yes, please. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Guido Loprano. I'm from uh, Business Europe, the Confederation of European Industry. Um, I would like to hear more from uh, Mr. Munt and Mr. Petruzzella about the effects of the practices you've been dealing with, both on of course, consumer harm, but also on the supply side. In um, our approach, in the approach of my authority, uh, the uh, rules about uh, economic dependence must be used according with uh, um, our uh, competition uh, aim. It means that we uh, find a, a firm and an undertaking only when and only if uh, this uh, behavior affects the dynamics of the market, not only when uh, there is uh, a problem of imbalance between uh, the parties. This is our approach, uh, this isn't, uh, of course, uh, a, but this is our suggestion. I, I, I would endorse that. I would even say we would never or we would hardly go for a fine in these kind of cases uh, because these are cases with a, usually with a complex economic assessment underlying the behavior uh, which is not suitable for, for fines, I would say. Uh, that is one thing. Um, we we also look at the fa at the fact at the at the fact um, or at the question: uh, Does it have an impact on on the competition? But we don't only look at the 
short-term effects. I think this is what, what is important in this area. Biopower at, 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 a, short -term, at a, a short term run uh, hardly uh, affects competition in this area, but you have to look at what is happening over time. And there you have, for example, you could have an, an impact of biopower, for example, if you look at a merger. Um, we have this concentration process going on. We see smaller companies going out of the market. We see smaller companies um, leaving, for example, purchasing agreements of smaller retailers. Uh, and that again leads, from our point of view, or can lead uh, to even higher concentration uh, in, this, in this area. Um, I mean, buyer power is always extremely, is always extremely tricky, uh, as you know, but if you look at the long-term perspectives, how buyer power might evolve over time, um, it is maybe more critical. Another issue is that we see, I described that in my speech, we see buyer power creates, creates other competition issues. Uh, we have a lot of collusion in this area. Just to give you an example, we see biopower and we see, on the other hand, we see a lot of collusion. Um, we see cartels, we see resale price maintenance. So biopower in itself, from my point of view, can raise competition problems in other corners, so to say, which is not a direct but an indirect uh, effect of biopower. But, um, I fully agree with you, uh, by, as a competition agency you must look carefully into the fact how biopower with respect to w always the question where does the rent go in the very end, is the consumer benefiting from this biopower uh, or is he not? Um, I think that is the effect that you have to look at, at uh, on the long run. Yes, and if I may, I was saying that we were doing this longer term 10 year study, it's precisely to find out whether over the longer term this buyer power may have an impact on, on, on choice and uh, innovative uh, products. Well, we'll see whether the Greek presidency has been able to exercise some buying power on their suppliers of uh, food products. Um, so I think I can now invite all of you for lunch and th thank the panel once again for their contribution. And be back at two sharp, please. Thank you.